Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. I'm Susan Coffin. You're listening to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Audio. We often talk about attention deficit disorder as a disorder of attention or of being too active, hyperactive, or being impulsive. But today's topic is emotion and the emotional side of attention deficit disorder. Uh, We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Thomas Brown back again today as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Brown has been at the forefront of focusing on this aspect of ADHD, the emotional side of regulation. He'll be talking about how our emotions can, as he puts it, gobble up all the space in our minds and lead us to overreact or underreact. Frustration, hurt feelings, irritability, mood swings, emotional reactions of all kinds that, you know, have not traditionally been associated with attention deficit disorder. Dr. Brown is an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine. He's the associate director of their Yale Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders. He's the author of a number of books, including his new book, Smart But Stuck, Emotions in Teens and Adults with ADHD. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Dr. Brown. Thank you again so much for being here today. You are Thank one you. of our most popular speakers, and we're really happy to have you. Thank you for, for being here. It's my pleasure, and I, I thank all of you who have tuned in to uh, listen and watch this. As Susan mentioned, the, the topic of emotion hasn't been talked about very much in ADHD literature, and it's not mentioned at all in the current diagnostic criteria for ADHD, but those of us who uh, are involved in doing assessment and treatment for ADHD and anybody who has ADHD themselves uh, or who lives with or knows well somebody with ADHD uh, is likely to be able to recognize that emotions are a big part of what uh, people with ADHD struggle with. And it's not that their emotions are different from the emotions that other people have but rather that there are some difficulties that impact uh, their, their emotions uh, as part of the ADHD. And it seems to me that it's also important to say that, that the emotions are important not simply in terms of how somebody expresses their emotion. A lot of the talk uh, about emotion, a little bit of talk that has come up over the last few years about emotions in ADHD has emphasized Uh, people being able to control negative emotions. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But uh, what I'd like to emphasize is that, uh, at least what I'm talking about today, about the role of emotions, uh, both both positive and negative emotions. Uh, And it seems to me that these are important not only in terms of uh, issues around somebody shooting their mouth off, uh, saying uh, too much of what they're feeling in a particular situation, but they're also important in terms of prioritizing and getting started on tasks. Uh, they're important in terms of being able to sustain interest and effort for tasks and to shift interest uh, and uh, effort for tasks. They're important in being able to determine what things we keep in mind in our active working memory. And they certainly are important in our choosing to engage in or just stay out of and avoid various tasks and situations. And so what I'm trying to suggest here is that that the role of emotions is a much bigger thing than simply emotions being problematic for people who uh, can't put the lid on it when they're expressing them. So I'm beginning with the assumption that children and adults with ADHD experience similar emotions to most everybody else of about the same age. Uh, And what I'm suggesting is that... uh, at least the people I know who have ADHD, and that's quite a few of them, uh, have more difficulty sometimes in recognizing what emotions uh, are important to them at a particular moment, what they're feeling, and being able to respond to them and in their actions, uh, and in being able to manage them in terms of how much uh, one does about whatever the feelings are that, that one's dealing with. And so that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. But let me first just give a few examples of the sort of thing that, that I see clinically in talking with people about this. Um, and on this slide, you can see that I'm mentioning a number of different kinds of feelings. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but uh, let me just give you a few specific examples. Uh, my favorite example of, 
of the frustration uh, is a salesman I saw one time uh, who came in. He said, you know, I was at the diner yesterday, late afternoon, having lunch. And I was pretty good mood sitting there eating my sandwich. There's not many people around. Guy in the booth behind me got his sandwich. He's chewing too loud. He's going chomp, chomp, chomp on every bite. He said, there was something about that noise that was driving me nuts. It was as though a computer virus had gotten into my head and just gobbled up all the space. That's all I could think about was that damn noise. I, I had seen it with my fist clenched, seriously thinking about getting up and smacking this guy in the mouth because he was chewing uh, it was so obnoxiously loud. Uh, and yet, you know, as he uh, was doing this, uh, I, I was thinking about how I wanted to just sort of shut him up by smacking him in the mouth, but I didn't do it. I didn't want to get arrested. If I'd been at home, I would have been yelling at somebody or I would have walked out of the room. But uh, as it worked out, within a couple of minutes, he's still making the same noise, but that didn't bother me anymore. He said, you know, it, it's not always like that, though. Sometimes I get so frustrated, but uh, let me give you another example. He said that what happens with me is that uh, when I have a feeling of frustration uh, like that, where I'm just getting annoyed about it, uh, it's like something that you could, if you had a scale of frustration, it goes from zero to ten, where zero means not much of a problem and ten is, is really uh, going off the wall. Uh, a lot of stuff, he says, that uh, happens to me that frustrates me, that, thing, that most people would say, oh, it's a zero or a one. It's the most maybe it's a two. Well, it be like it's a seven or an eight or a nine. Now, sometimes I'll make a big fuss about it, and other times I don't say anything, but I feel this surge of anger where I feel like punching somebody or breaking something, and then it's usually over pretty quickly. But it's not always that way. He said, the day before that, I was at the office. I'm walking down the hall. And you know, a friend of mine came around the corner from the other side and was walking toward me, reading some papers as he's walking. And I hadn't seen him for a long time, so as we approached each other, I stopped and said, Hey, what's up? How you doing? I figured we'd stop and chat for him. And he looks up, says hi, puts his head down, keeps right on walking. He said, Now, most people will blow that off in just a minute and figure, Well, he's in a hurry. He's got to get to a meeting or something. We'll talk later. He said, Not me. Said, that happened at lunchtime. I got nothing done for the rest of the day. I spent all afternoon thinking I'd do something to... to uh, to offend him, piss him off, or maybe I offended somebody in his department and all angry with me. But what happened was that I just couldn't think about anything else all afternoon. I just kept wondering, what did I do to make that happen? Other people, they don't have things like that get stuck in their head that way. But they do have a different kind of experience, and that is they get an idea in their head of something they want to do or something they want to get or something they want to buy. And all of a sudden, that wish takes on such intensity that it, it's almost as though that's all they can think about. You know, and it, it, I, the feeling is, I've got to have it now. And it almost doesn't matter how expensive it is or how inconvenient it is to them or to somebody else or whether they're using time and money today for this that they know that they are going to need for something else tomorrow that's more important. They're just this relentless push. I've got to have it now. And even if they get it, they're not that happy because usually by then they're off on something else they want. But other people, it's not like that. Other people with ADD uh, are like one fellow that I spoke with. He said, you know, I was driving along the expressway the other day, and I was in the left lane. I had the Jersey barrier to my left, and there was this big 18-wheeler truck to my right. And we're driving along about 65 miles an hour, and this truck starts pulling over a little bit. He didn't get into my lane. It got me thinking about, you know, how big his truck was and how small my car was. And pretty soon I'm thinking to myself, what would happen if he didn't see me? And he pulled over and squished me against the Jersey barrier. And pretty soon I'm not just thinking about it. I'm running a very vivid movie in my head, imagining exactly what it would look like if that truck came over and smashed into my car and scrunched it all against the Jersey barrier. And then... Uh, cars getting dragged along the Jersey barrier, sharp pieces of metal are sticking into me, and I'm bleeding to death, and, and the, the, then the truck jackknifes, and cars and trucks behind us are hitting us, and there's this massive traffic jam, and it takes a long time to get the rescue squad in to cut me out of the car, and by that time, I've bled to death. And they have to call my family and tell them I'm dead. And all this, while well, I'm trying to drive the car 65 miles an hour down the road. And he says, stuff like that happens to me all the time, where... 
basically everything's going along okay, and I start thinking, what would happen if this happened, or what would happen if that happened, and pretty soon I'm not just thinking about it, I'm into it. Now, it's not like anybody with ADD has all this stuff, but many will have one or some combination of a couple of these, but what they have in common is that computer virus in the head thing, the emotion, whether it's the hurt feelings or pissed off over trivia or I've got to have it now or what would happen if this or if that, just comes in and just gobbles up all the space in their head. And it's very difficult for them to put it in perspective, put it in the back of their mind, and then get on with what they've got to do. And uh, this is the sort of thing which can be problematic because it's a kind of flooding with one emotion and that often people with ADHD, partly as a, a function of the difficulty with working memory, where it's hard to keep one thing in mind while doing something else, they get so flooded with it that they're likely to react in ways that afterwards they wish they hadn't. You know, for example, I'm thinking of one uh, man who got very angry with his kids because they didn't do the chore they'd been assigned of bringing in the uh, garbage cans that had been put out the night before for the uh, trash guys to pick up. And uh, when he came home and saw that the kids were home and that the two of them had left these garbage cans sitting down at the foot of the driveway, he just lashed out at them and talked about how they were useless, they weren't doing anything, they were going to get no place in the world because they, they done, weren't taking on responsibilities and uh, a long list of how this was such a terrible thing. And I remember his wife was saying, you know, it really bothers me because I know the kids are kind of used to it that he loses it by the way. But the fact is he loves these kids, and it's very hard for them to keep that in mind when he's talking to them as though they're utter failures because they haven't brought the trash cans in. And I think that there are a lot of people I've talked with who have ADD who, uh, and others who live with them and who are friends with them and care about them, who just realize that often people with ADHD will sort of you know, express their frustration of the moment in a way that doesn't take into account who they're talking to and what the effect of those comments might be on the other person. And uh, that's an area which can cause a lot of problems and a lot of hurt feelings because, you know, it, afterwards often they will apologize, they said, sorry, I didn't mean to be so harsh, but the fact is the words have been said and they've often been said with so much intensity that it's hard for the other person completely to erase them from their head. And it may or may not get the trash cans brought in the next week. Uh, see, a lot of the discussion... Uh, about ADHD, this is what I was alluding to earlier, uh, in emotions these days is so focused on putting on the brakes. It's sort of a trying to address that problem of, of uh, coming on too strong with uh, frustration or anger or some other feelings. And one of the things that I think needs to be looked at a little more carefully is that that most folks I know with ADHD don't have problems only with putting the, the brakes on or putting the lid on feelings of anger and frustration. They also often get stuck in having difficulties in being able to get started on things they need to do. You know, that it's not just a problem with the brakes, it's a problem also with the ignition, being able to begin. Uh, I just recently published a book uh, called Smart But Stuck, where I've got a number of case studies. And uh, this is just a, one of them, a 20-year-old college student who came to see me. And uh, his opening statement was, I'm in a great university where I want to do well, but I just can't get myself motivated to do the work. I did really well in high school, but now my grades have tanked. I've been spending too much time hanging out with my girlfriend and smoking weed. I've tried some ADHD medicines, but they make me too jittery. Now, there's a long story here that we don't have time to go into right now, but let me just mention a couple of things about this because somebody could look at that and say, well, the problem is just he's got to cut back on smoking the weed and not spend so much time with his girlfriend. Uh, but he's been told that a lot. And as we uh, talked about it and I had a chance to get to know him a little better, what became clear was that this was one of those kids who had had some difficulties in high school, but then 
was able to uh, do quite well because he had very strong support from parents and tutors uh, that helped him to get his work done, to remember what he needed to do and so forth. And he was very much engaged in a, a very busy program of athletics. He was quite an athlete. And uh, that held him together. And he had some friends he'd been in school with for years. When he made that move to college, where all of a sudden the scaffolding, which had been supporting him, was all removed, what hit was his awareness of how he couldn't do so much of this stuff himself. And he began to get very anxious, and he had a lot of difficulty in functioning. ADHD medicines really did make him too jittery. He's one of those people with a very sensitive body chemistry. And so they, they couldn't use that to help him. But what happened was that there was just a lot of anxiety underlying all this. And it got to the point where it was just unable, he was unable to manage it. And he just began smoking marijuana, which helps to reduce his anxiety, but also caused him to uh, fail to pay attention to things that he really did need to pay attention to. And this is an example, I think, of how sometimes... Uh, we just look at the surface of things and may think we've got a handle on the problem and not realize that, in fact, uh, underneath that there's some emotions, like in this case, fear, discouragement, hopelessness, uh, that need to be addressed and understood before you have much chance of being help able to help the person move on. As I've spoken with people about these issues, one of the things that that also comes up is not just the flooding uh of one emotion, but also the difficulty in being able to keep in mind what else is going on. And the metaphor that I found useful for thinking about it is, if you, imagine what it's like if you're watching a game. Many of us have been watching the March Madness uh, games, incidentally, uh, if you didn't notice the Connecticut men won last night, uh, the national title, we were pleased about that. But I imagine watching a basketball game through a telescope, where you could magnify what was what's going on in that little bit of uh, the action that you're able to catch with the telescope, but while you're watching that, you can't see what else is happening on the rest of the floor. You know, that the game is going on. You can't see where the defenders are moving. You can't see uh, where the ball is being passed to or where it might be passed to, and you sort of lose track of the bigger picture. And many people with ADHD uh, talk about how often uh, they live too much in the moment. I'm thinking, for example, of a, a woman who had problems at work, and uh, she'd been up late the night before. There was some big argument that she was having in the family, and she couldn't sleep, and, she, and uh, so she was very tired when her alarm went off and decided she was hit the snooze alarm, and then it went off again, and she decided just to turn the whole alarm clock off, completely forgetting that just two days earlier, the boss had told her about how she'd been coming in late to work too often and that that was really going to be a problem at work if it kept up. You see, it's like the working memory was not holding in mind the fact that I've got a problem at work and I've got to be careful about being there on time. All she was able to focus on at that moment, the little piece she could see through the telescope was, I'm tired, I didn't get enough sleep last night, and I don't feel like getting out of bed right now. I'm just going to sleep for a little bit longer. It turned out she slept too long and, and damn near lost her job as a result of it. And another case that often occurs, I think, particularly with adolescents, uh, is illustrated by this 14-year-old girl uh, who was talking about how uh, she'd been an honor student when she was in elementary school and never got into much trouble at all, mostly all A's. Everybody was uh, very complimentary about her, all the teachers. Uh, but she came in, and her parents were very frustrated with her, and, and she, she said... Look, now everybody thinks I'm just hopeless uh, because I dress goth and I don't do much homework. My parents and teachers all look down on me just because of the friends I hang out with. They don't really know me or my friends. And it looked like a kid who was just basically flipping the bird to uh, all the grown-ups in her world and getting very oppositional, and certainly a lot of adolescents do at that point. But what became clear as we got into talking about that a little more is that this was a girl who was terribly worried about the fact that her her father had been diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disorder, uh, which was in seriously impeding his ability to walk. And it was also impacting him so that he was getting very crabby uh, with members of the family 
And uh, that wasn't the way he used to be. He would uh, for a long time, been very supportive. He, he had Parkinson's disease. And it was getting progressively worse, at least at that episode. And she was scared to death about what was happening to him. But all that was coming through was this defiant oppositional attitude. And she was having a hard time putting that out of her mind and was hanging out with a bunch of kids who basically were helping her to chill. Again, the example is simply to make the point that there are layers to feelings as we uh, experience them. And, uh, and we need to look at that when we're trying to, to deal with ADHD. So emotions, uh, you keep in mind, it's very rarely one thing, that emotions often come in layers. And you can have somebody who's really angry and underneath that the fear, the kind of thing I was just talking about with the case of Sue. And then sometimes somebody who's acting like very afraid, afraid about something, underneath that it may be they're afraid of it because they're hopeless about being able to do well at it. Or hopelessness can cover fear. And often we deal up, all of us, dealing with feelings of wanting to do something and not wanting to do it. Or thinking, well, it doesn't really matter, but underneath we also know it, it uh, matters a lot. And so part of the, the difficulty that we all face in dealing with emotions is to recognize that possibly both sides of our conflicting emotions about something may be true, and that we need to pay some attention to that when we're trying to help one another to deal with it. It matters a lot who you're with and what you're doing. Uh, I can tell you a story about that. I was on an international uh, flight with my wife uh, and, uh, across the Atlantic, and uh, the airline was, uh, we were, fortunate enough to be riding in business class, and they were baking these delicious chocolate chip cookies in the middle of the flight, and they were coming around and offering them to people. And I, at the time, I was on a diet and trying to lose a few pounds and was being pretty careful about getting to the gym and, and not eating a lot of stuff I shouldn't be eating. And my wife was like the food police uh, who would re remind me about what I shouldn't be eating. And so they're coming up the aisle offering these things, and I look over to my wife, and she's sound asleep. And uh, I'm struggling myself, thinking, well, those smell awfully good. I'd like to have one. And, uh, no, I shouldn't do that. Uh, I uh, really uh, ought not to be eating that stuff right now. It's not good for my diet. But she was still asleep when the uh, flight attendant got there with it. And after obsessing about it for a couple of minutes, uh, I he said, uh, well, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like that. They were giving milk and cookies. And I said, on top of that, could I get one for my wife when she wakes up? And uh, I did, they kindly gave it to me, and, of course, I sat there and gobbled up both cookies very quickly and then very uh, dutifully went back to the galley and gave them the plates back so I could dispose of the evidence. Um, and you know, it got, got into my stomach before the food police could catch me. Uh, who you're with and where you are can shift your feelings a lot. If she had been awake, uh, when they offered it, I would have felt very good about saying, well, thank you very much, I'm on a diet, I can't have that. Think about how that applies to who our kids hang out with and who we hang out with in other situations. It matters who you're with. The context matters, and different feelings are up at different times. And emotions in the family. Any of you who are raising kids where one or more members of the family have ADHD are likely to know that often parents of a kid with ADHD get stressed out, particularly uh, when they're trying to decide whether they should be toughening up or con and confronting the kid or backing off, you know, you get the, the one parent who says, if this kid has to learn how to de deal with the world as it really is, uh, we can't be making excuses for him all the time. Let him feel the heat of the consequences. And the other family member, it could be a mother or father taking either of these roles, says, this kid's in trouble every place he goes. Don't you think there's one place, like maybe home, where he ought to be able to feel more comfortable and not feel like everybody's on him all the time. And what happens often in the family is that these emotions polarize. So you end up with the parents arguing with one another, the butt kicker versus the marshmallow, and uh, it gets more intense than it really needs to be because the real task is for those two parents to learn to work together to make those difficult decisions day by day about when to back off and when to bend a little more be more flexible and when to hold the line and help the kid to deal with the real world. And these are things that we all struggle with. And, you know, it's important, particularly when you're, next slide please, uh, when you're trying to decide how to respond to your kids when they're having trouble. 
and we know that uh, people with ADHD often have a hard time waiting for things to happen further. And so it's important to uh, deal with the fact that often they think about what's happening now and not too much about what's going to happen later. And so principles like you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, yelling at people doesn't very often work, at least not for long. And it's important also to keep the corrections and penalties short and focused and the rewards pretty much immediate on top of uh, whatever the event is that you're trying to encourage. Uh, I've just pulled together here a list of a few things that I think could be helpful uh, in dealing with this sort of thing in the family. I think it's important for all of us to get some help from one another, our other family, our spouses, our friends, uh, to help us recognize our own conflicting feelings, to spend some talking uh, time with our kids and with one another about where we're headed and what we're hoping for and what they're hoping for. Often our medications for ADHD can provide some help in dealing with these emotional difficulties. When you've got to confront another member of the family, it's probably not a good idea to do it when you're too heated up. It might be better to wait for a cooler moment and say, look, we got to talk about this, but not now. Uh, and you, you anticipate and prepare for things where you know damn well there's going to be a big hassle. Uh, take a little time to think about what you're going to do. And you might want to look into that getting to yes strategy, that book that's been around a long time, about how we can work with our kids and with one another to try and figure out, okay, what are you looking for? What am I looking for? How can we solve this so that it's not a, a zero-sum game, but that both of us can win something of what we want, even if not the whole thing? So let me stop here and just mention that uh, this new book is called Smart But Stuck, Emotions in Teens and Adults with ADHD. There's an initial chapter that talks a little bit about the theory behind this, and there are 11 cases that I've written about in some detail, some true stories to tell you about how I've learned about uh, how people have been struggling with this. If you want to read a segment of it, it's available on my website for free, or the book is available uh, in bookstores and online now. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, there are lots of questions here. Uh, before we take some specific ones about emotions, I wanted to just ask a couple of diagnostic questions that came through. Okay. Um, uh, given the emotional side of ADHD, people, a couple of people have asked whether um, how that relates to bipolar disease. Is it one of the reasons why people with ADHD are, are oftentimes misdiagnosed with bipolar? Or is there also a bipolar and ADHD comorbidity that, that occurs that has that, this emotional side to it? Well, I think both um, of those things are true. Okay. That, uh, there's, uh, I think the distinctions between ADHD and other disorders are often quantitative rather than qualitative, by which by that I mean simply that there's a certain amount of difficulty managing emotion that I think just goes with ADHD. Uh, and then there's a level where if a person's having way, way, way too much of it too often uh, and meets some other symptom characteristics, uh, then we sort of draw the line and say, well, above this line we say this is looking more like a mood disorder problem. Okay. And so it's it's something which I think we need to, to just sort of take a good look at clinically when we're doing evaluations and see. So but it's I not necessarily... Sometimes. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. So it's not necessarily easy to distinguish well, between the Well, I think it, it, it needs the clinician to take some time to, to talk with okay. the uh, person involved and the people around them and find out how often and sort of with what severity uh, and not to be too quick to diagnose somebody as bipolar simply because they get real crabby sometimes or uh, they have mood swings uh, because sometimes it may be the reactivity that just goes with the difficulty that many people with ADHD have in managing emotions. And in other okay. cases, it may be severe enough that it does warrant a separate diagnosis and a different targeting of treatment. Okay, got it. And then the other question related to your comment about the DSM, you said at one point, or in your slide, you said that... Um, the emotional side of ADHD is not explicitly recognized in the DSM. Is it recognized at all? Is, are there any criteria that people listening to the webinar can take to their clinicians to bring up the emotional aspect the of ADHD? They're not explicit, but what I was trying to say in that slide and what I've tried to elaborate on in, in this new book is that a lot of things like difficulty in being able to keep in mind what one was about to do and difficulty in getting organized and prioritizing tasks 
uh, that those are things where emotions are very much involved because the basis on which the brain makes decisions about what we're going to pay attention to uh, okay. is linked to memory. And one's ability to pull, using working memory, to pull out of our file cabinets of memory within our minds uh, what things are important and what things are relevant and, and uh, help to set those priorities. And if a person has problems with working memory, as many people with ADHD do, uh, that sometimes involves they're not being able to think about all the things that they ought to think about at this particular moment and sort out the priorities. For example, if the boss is giving you an assignment which seems like it's, it's really asking more of you than is reasonable uh, because there's somebody else sitting in the next cubicle who's not getting much work at all, and you feel like telling the, the boss what to do with the, this new task in a pretty harsh way, uh, that feeling of this is what I'm going to tell him, he deserves to be told about this, uh, it's not fair, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, needs to be countered by a thought about, okay, well, what's likely to happen if I do this? And uh, keeping being that ability to keep in mind what else is there that's important as I quickly decide what to do about this particular situation. Speak or not speak, uh, raise my voice or not raise my voice. Um, think about it overnight and then decide or what. And different things are called for at different times, but usually people have the information in their head, but they may not be able to pull it out uh, in the way that most other people would be able to. Okay. Um, let me just move to some of the specific questions now, which are... are so many interesting ones. A um, number of people have mentioned just the shame, feeling really ashamed by their outbursts, by their behavior, and then the implications of that, or, or in their children seeing that shame. Do you have any comments on, on how to cope with the sort of shame of, of, of the emotional side of ADHD? Well, it, it depends on uh, which part we're looking at, but I, it sounds like the, one of the things that maybe that questioner was alluding to is that if a parent who has ADHD or a parent who's dealing with an ADHD child who's very frustrated uh, finds themselves shooting off their mouth at the kid uh, and coming on what seems to them later to be way too strong, even though it's felt intensely at the moment, the shame is, you know, how could I have said this to my kid? You know, the, you know I talked with a mother recently who was, uh, you know, had said to her kid in a fit of anger, I wish you'd never been born. My whole life would have been a lot easier if I didn't have to deal with this. And obviously, it was, you know, when she thought about it, you know, three seconds later, she realized that uh, those words that had come out of her mouth were just an intense way of trying to say, this is damn frustrating right now. Uh, and it has been quite a bit over this past week or six months or longer. Uh, but, you know, it was not that she really wished the kid never to have been born, but she couldn't take the words back. And so the, the shame that she felt of having lost control that way and having spoken so harshly to her kid uh, was a, a, a real burden to her. And I think in that situation, we need to have other people to talk with. It could be a spouse if they're understanding. It could be a friend. It could be a therapist. Uh, but to, for one thing, come to terms with the fact that all of us, ADD or not, have times when we lose it, when the stress just gets up to be too much and we respond in ways that later we wish desperately that we'd never done. Um, but I think it's also important to sort of try and head off some of that by seeing to it that uh, we get some some help uh, by talking with other people who can understand even before things pile up that much. And especially I think one of our speakers once said, "You need to find your tribe, your fellow people who understand you and be able and be able to talk." Yeah, well, you're really lucky if you can find a tribe. Uh, some people are lucky if they can find a single. Uh, person who's understanding. Right. Sometimes it's a grandparent. Sometimes it's a neighbor. Uh, sometimes it's a, uh, you know, a teacher or, or a, a co-worker. But uh, somebody who at least you know, may have had some relevant experience and uh, who's willing to, uh, to 
you know, help you think through some of these things. Because if it's all echoing in your head and there's nobody else there to share it with, it intensifies the frustration, it intensifies the shame, and you sort of bounce back and forth between feeling terrible about yourself and feeling enraged with the person who's uh, got you frustrated enough that you actually did that. Okay. Let, let me ask you some about uh, the couple of posts from people that are really almost, they, they experience their emotions as being very flat, or they, this is a person, Matthew, who says, I'm an adult affected by ADHD, in situations that should be highly emotional, I feel almost numb, and I really don't express any emotions. Is this because I'm afraid of having, you know, uh, overreacting? And other, there are a couple of other people who have posted similar comments. It's, My it's hard, emotional reactions are a, should a be stronger than they are. Uh, I, the first thing I thought of as you began to bring this up is that uh, if a person with ADHD is taking medication, uh, stimulant medication particularly, and they feel like their emotions are generally flat, the first thing I would think about is, is the dose of the medication too high? Because one of the things that can happen with stimulants if the dose is too high is that there's sort of a blunting out of, of emotion that uh, you don't feel much of anything. Uh, and you, uh, the experience that people often say, I just feel like I'm too serious, I lose my spontaneity, I don't feel much like smiling or laughing when I'm on the medication. And it doesn't have to be that way, but uh, if a person's having that when they're taking the medicine and they're not having it when they're not taking the medicine, it's time to talk to the prescriber and think about reducing the dose or possibly switching the medicine because somebody ought to be able to, taking medicine for ADHD, ought to be able to be their regular self when they're on it. But I okay. think uh, perhaps what this particular person was talking about is something a little different, and that is that there's some people who either as a result of the way they've grown up or perhaps some other experiences have learned to keep the lid on things. And uh, sometimes it, it, it's a matter of depression where it may not be the uh, I'm so depressed I can't get out of bed and I wonder if I'd be better off dead kind of depression, but it may be more what we call dysphymia, which is sort of a low-grade chronic depression where you can keep on doing most of what you have to do, but you just don't enjoy any of it very much, even things that you used to enjoy a lot. And so in that situation, uh, often the pleasure uh, comes out and you end up you know, not giving a damn about anything one way or the other. So it, it's possible it's part of depression, or it may be there are some people certainly who uh, live too much in their heads and, and have, for whatever combination of genetic and uh, growing up experiences, have learned to keep all their emotions under wrap. And in some ways that may protect them, and in some other ways it probably makes it harder for them to connect with and sustain meaningful relationships with other people. Um, so it's a hard question to answer because there's so many different possible reasons for it. Right, um, of course, yes. Um, here's a very common question, a common problem for ADHD parents, and a number of people have posed to this, <laughs> posed this problem. How should a parent deal with a child their child, this is often a teenager who just becomes irrationally, irrational or even um, abusive or violent, um, but verbally so, and continually repeats things that are, you know, sort of frustrating. How, how does a parent help bring their child out of that state? And one person, Barbara, who posted this question said, you know, oftentimes her son, once he gets out of it, is embarrassed, shamed, so unhappy by the way he behaved. Yeah. So, but while it's in the moment, what, what, should an, what should a parent do? The first thing you do is avoid engaging with them. You know, at that point, I think it's really, the important thing is do not escalate things by trying to argue them down. You want to make it clear that you'll be glad to talk with them when they can talk with you about whatever the issue is in a reasonable way, but that right now they're obviously so annoyed and, and or enraged or whatever word fits best, that uh, it's not going to be productive to have a conversation. So I'm not going to talk with you right now. My suggestion is why don't you go out in the yard and walk around a little bit or go to your room for a while. And when you're ready, as, 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 at any time that I can be ready, we've got to find a time that will work for both of us. Let's talk about it, but uh, not now. 
And that works fine if they actually do it. Sometimes they'll follow you around the house. And, right. <laughs> why not? But why not? But why not? And, um, you know, but that's something that if at that point you give in and say, well, let me explain to you why not, uh, then you're going to reinforce the behavior and it's going to keep happening. But if you basically make clear that you are not going to carry on a conversation with somebody who's irrationally screaming at you. Right. Um, okay. That's it. Now, if it ever crosses the line into violence where somebody is, uh, is you know, punching holes in walls or getting in your face and threatening to hit or is actually hitting or pushing, then you warn them once. And if that doesn't do it, call 911 and get the cops. Wow. Uh, okay. Because there, uh, there is good reason to maintain that line. And, mm-hmm. you know, a parent who puts up with a child be, you know, being violent, physically violent or, you know, believably threatening violence, um, it gives them the impression that if, you know, and then you give in, uh, it just reinforces the same behavior and it's likely to escalate from time to time and somebody can really get hurt. Right. The, the rule is you don't put your hands on somebody else in anger. You know, I have, we have had the experience in these webinars of, um, of people whose children are, or are, are really very um, oppositional to the point of violence and, and almost always the response from the speaker has been that's the point at which you no longer cope with this one-on-one. You get outside help immediately. So Yeah, it, it, it is that. important. Yeah. And if, if, but if, if there's any danger of anybody getting hurt, you know, it's far better to call the cops because, you know, as you, gave, as you mentioned, there are many kids in that situation, if that's allowed to go on, they feel worse later. And I've, I've seen kids sometimes who have actually caused serious injury or very serious property damage, uh, you know, which later they felt terrible about. And it's important, you know, to uh, make clear that if this kid cannot control himself or herself and you, you, you don't want to move on, if they're really young and little, uh, you know, sometimes you can move on them to, you know, just hold them until they can calm down. But that gets ineffective very quickly as they get older, and you can no longer safely contain them. Right, right. Um, turning to another topic, guilt. There are several people on the webinar. One person put it this way. I have difficulty coping with regret about decisions I made or didn't make, opportunities missed, time wasted. I'm always focused on why or why didn't I do this or that. And another person said a similar made a similar comment about her child, who is always focused on why not, what if I'd done this, what if I hadn't. So this sort of almost obsessive regret, focus on the regret, I guess, is, is the issue. Um, well, it, that, that is a problem that a lot of us struggle with. And, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned both the regret that the kid can have and the regret the parent can have, because often, particularly if there's been some big confrontation, both parties feel terrible about what's happened. And I think that, that one thing that can be useful in a situation like that is to create a climate in which regret is acknowledged and that it's clear that all of us sometimes do things that we wish very much we had done differently. You know, and the fact is you can't change what was. All you can do is try and change what is and what's going to be from now on. And to be, uh, you know, it, it, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't accept an apology or make an apology. You know, I think being willing to apologize and, and uh, recognize that, yeah, I got a little too carried away with that when I told you that I'm taking your Xbox away, uh, you know, for the next two years. Um, um, interesting question from Tamar. Why is it that managing emotions is so difficult as an adult with ADD? And she's wondering whether the ADD brain just doesn't process information quickly enough so that the reaction is just based on only part of the information rather than the whole story. Yeah, well, I think, um, that, I think it's the biggest component of cognitive functioning that's involved in contributing to this problem, I think, is impairment of working memory being able to keep in mind multiple things at the same time. You know, and it, if you think about what happens if you Google something uh, and you go, okay, here's the topic I want to know about, and so you Google the topic, put a keyword in, and you get back, you know, maybe, uh, you know, six or a dozen or hundreds of different responses, 
Um, you need to look at them one at a time. But the way our minds work is much faster and much more complex than that, and we've got simultaneous processing along a number of different channels of the brain, and that most people generally have that sort of calculus done, uh, it's actually done through the amygdala primarily in its connections with other parts of the brain. It's part of what I talk about in the first chapter of that new book, uh, where all of a sudden, you, you know, you are aware of the fact you start to feel the anger, you're about ready to let go on your spouse or your friend or your coworker, and then you keep in mind that, uh, oh, by the way, this is, you know, this is somebody who right now is under a lot of pressure from some other uh, stressors, and you say, all right, this is the right time to do it. Uh, or and Whereas that uh, using, again, that basketball through a telescope, watching the basketball game through a telescope example I was using before, that the, the person with ADD often has difficulty in being able to, to, to look at the whole field of action at one time, to be able to pull together the way most other people of the same age might be able to, the several different relevant things that are going on. And uh, that's uh, an important part of what I think we've overlooked, and that is that, that it's not just a matter of our, you know, people with ADHD often having trouble inhibiting themselves from shooting off their mouths or taking other angry actions but that often it's hard for, for folks with ADHD because of, for the same reason that, that they lose track of what they are doing when they're trying to clean the house sometimes. Or you sort of get hung up on one particular thing. Oh, yeah, look at this box of pictures I just found in the dresser drawer. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to check this out. Forget that you were cleaning the house because you've got some people coming over in half an hour and you needed to get this tidied up a little bit more now that being able to keep one thing in mind while doing something else is something which is quite challenging for a lot of people with ADHD. Right. Um, I want to come back to your example of Eric. Mm -hmm. And a number of people have wondered how, how was he able to turn around and discontinue his use of marijuana. Um, and uh, I think there are a number of, of participants on the webinar who are coping with addiction issues or, or children who for whom marijuana use right. is um Okay, well, the first problem. thing you do is begin with the fact that the main, uh, what, marijuana, the THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, is one of the best things around for reducing anxiety. Uh, the problem with it is that it hangs around in the bloodstream and in, in the brain uh, for about three weeks after it's ingested and it only gradually tapers down so that everything that a person has smoked over the last three weeks is going to be involved. If, you know, if somebody's not smoked before and they smoke today and I uh, send a lab sample in of blood or urine three weeks from now, I'm still going to be able to pick up the fact that they had the, the THC in their system. Uh, it does not clear. And so that's why a lot of people who uh, smoke more than just a little bit, end up piling up so much of the THC in their in their bloodstream uh, that they don't give a damn about things they really do need to give a damn about. And so the first thing to do is to understand the reason why people tend to do this is usually to reduce anxiety. Now, there are a lot of peer pressure things sometimes, but not always. Uh, but uh, there also are... Uh, a whole lot of other factors that enter in that some people start out trying to smoke just once in a while, socially or, or to reduce anxiety, and then it gets easier and easier to do it more and more, and pretty soon they're uh, twice a day stoners uh, who don't give a damn about stuff that they always used to care a lot about. You know, and so understanding why it's, it's going on uh, is important, and then also to rec anybody who tells you you can't get addicted to marijuana it just doesn't understand how it affects people. Now, it's not the kind of addiction which you have where you like heroin or cocaine where uh, if you don't have the drug, you go into acute uh, physiological withdrawal, but there's a psychological dependence on this which can be very nasty to, to try and get away from. So what can you do about it? Uh, one thing is to recognize that if you insist upon moving immediately to abstinence and you just don't smoke at all, uh, it's very unlikely to work. You know, there are some people where they have to do it that way. It's the only way they're going to be able to quit or uh, get it under control. There are other people who, uh, who, for whom a harm reduction approach works much better, where you just 
try to work with them a little bit to cut down how often and how much they smoke and gradually uh, reduce the damage that it's doing. And everybody thinks they can control it, and some people can and some people can't. And uh, very often people say, well, I need to send a kid to rehab, and uh, they'll keep him 30 days, and he'll come out, and he'll be clean. But then they go back to the same group of friends. And, um, you know, it's not like you're suddenly you've been hanging out with a bunch of stoners. It's not like you're suddenly going to find a whole new bunch of friends at school. So it takes somebody who knows something about how these chemicals, particularly marijuana, which is one of the most widely used drugs, operates. And there are some people who can smoke once or twice a week, and they do just fine. Just like there's some people who can have one or two beers once in a while, and it doesn't seriously interfere with their functioning. And then there are other people who start that way, and it rapidly escalates. And it's very important to look at this and uh, try and see it in context of the particular person who's involved and try and um, address what are the needs that this is fulfilling and what other supports can be in there, and also being sure you've got accurate information. Okay. I think the point that you made about understanding the underlying emotional in this particular case was extremely helpful. Um, that that what appears to be not caring was actually an underlying anxiety. Yeah. And a, a couple of people who have either a spouse or a child whose behavior, you know, they're they're having difficulty working with, are wondering, you know, what are some techniques you would recommend to get under that top layer so that you you do understand what actually is going on. Well, that's the place where uh, it takes somebody who's who's got. Uh, an ability to talk with people and listen to them. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it's not that easy to find a clinician who uh, is, is able to do the, t the talking and the listening and get access to them. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't have to be a professional clinician. Sometimes it's, it's a neighbor or a relative who's had some experience with this. Uh, it's some parents can do it very well with their kids, and there are other kids that were the combination of the parent and kid trying to talk about uh, this sort of problem just doesn't work, and you need somebody else to, to do it, because what's imperative is to enlist the support of the kid in, or the adult, if it's an adult who's, in, who's locked into this, and recognize that at best you're going to be working with a balance of 51 versus 49% that they want it and they don't want it. Most of those kids I've seen who are big-time stoners, on the one hand, want to quit, want to get, you know, get off the stuff so they're not uh, you know, messing up and you know, basically deadening their motivation uh, as much as they have been because they can see the price they pay. Uh, but at the same time, marijuana is their friend, and that's what's helped to reduce their anxiety or their guilt or their depression. Uh, and they've taken refuge in it. And if you don't take both sides of the ambivalence of that into account, you're not going to get very far because you can't police this very effectively at all at home. Do you think, um, and this is a question I'm passing on for a number of people, that people with attention deficit disorder are more prone to addiction? Yeah. Whether that be alcohol, Absolutely whatever. true. There are a number of studies that suggest that if you have an ADHD diagnosis, that's been carefully made, you've got double the risk of having a, an addict, a, a, a addiction problem that rises to the level of diagnosis at some point in your life. That doesn't mean it's for sure going to happen. It just means you're in uh, a double risk group. And, um, and sometimes it happens during early adolescence, and some of them uh, are into it heavily for a few years, and then it clears up. They're not that interested in it anymore. And other times it escalates. But the things that the people with ADHD get addicted to generally are the same things that anybody else gets addicted to in this, in this population, and that is, in the general population, I mean, you know, marijuana and alcohol. Those are the things that are most readily available, uh, and they're the, the ones that, uh, you know, are most frequently used. There are very few who get addicted to the, to the medication that's used to treat ADHD, which is a worry a lot of people have. But it, uh, many people don't even like taking stimulants, and they don't get you the kind of high that people are seeking usually to try and mellow them out, kill them out. What about other kinds of addictions, whether, you know, TV, um, food, um, 
Well, you see that as well? If people can find something that helps them feel better at a time when they're feeling bad, in terms of they're t depressed, they're worried, you know, they're frustrated, um, often they keep, they're going to keep going back to that. For example, there are a lot of kids who spend huge amounts of time uh, playing video games. And, you know, you end up with this World of Warcraft or Call of Duty and that kind of thing where you're playing online against half the world and the game is going on whether you're uh, engaged at any moment or not. It's very hard to avoid going back to that for some people. And for some, it actually provides some social outlet because they sometimes form some relationships in the process uh, online. But the fact is you can get addicted to, uh, to this, but it's not in the sense of an addiction as it is to a substance, but it's where people end up, uh, you know, putting so much time and effort into doing the, the game. Of, I'm talking about four or five hours a day. And, you know, I see a lot of college students who flunked out of school or whose grade averages have hit the basement, uh, though they were very bright people, uh, because they were spending so much time playing the video game. And often, sometimes they're lonely kids, sometimes they're frightened kids, Sometimes uh, they're kids who are just seeking more action. Uh, and those things, you, you've got to you know, get some idea of what are the problems the person's trying to solve, what are the emotions that are pressing them, rather than just shaking your finger at somebody and saying you shouldn't be doing that. Right. Okay. So in general, people, some are wondering, do you, are you a believer in cognitive behavior therapy, um, group therapy? Question, there have been questions asked about the kinds of interventions that you think work best for dealing with this emotional side of ADHD. So much of it depends upon the individual patient and upon the people who are providing the treatment. Um, there are some, some problems that respond very well to cognitive behavioral uh, treatment uh, and you know, people are able to you know, sort of get targeted on specific behaviors that are going to change and work it, and it works out well. Uh, but there are also some cognitive behavioral therapists who don't spend enough time listening to the patient to get an idea of what the problems really need to be structured around and what they're trying to change. Some group therapy sessions are very helpful depending on whether or not it's a good fit for this individual and whether the therapist who's leading the group is able to protect people from getting hurt in the group and uh, help them to make constructive therapeutic use of it. Uh, there are a number of you know, different kinds of, of therapy which work well or not so well for a particular person, depending on who the clinician is and how well the chemistry and skills of that clinician fit with the needs of this particular person. So uh, rather than to endorse one particular kind of, of uh, treatment, uh, I think you have to look at the specifics of who's involved and, and uh, you know, what, and also what's available because you can't always. Get that makes them. sense. I mean, it's it's all about the skill and of the ther of the therapist. Of the therapist and the personality of the patient. And the personality, the, the match between there, the you know, therapist and the patient. Sometimes you get a good match, and sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Right. Uh, but the one thing I do feel strongly about is that when you're dealing with a complicated case of ADHD, there's a lot of emotional stuff involved as well. It's not enough just to give them medication. That's yeah. for sure, yeah. But you need somebody who's able to talk and listen and to offer some help. It doesn't help just to sit there and say, okay, tell me everything you're thinking. You need to be able to have somebody who's also going to be able to react and provide some support and sometimes some confrontation to be able to help the person get a little broader view of things without getting caught up in trying to just shake your finger at them. Yeah, I think it can be very difficult for people with ADD to, to choose therapy or, um, you know, that part of being focused in the moment can mean also just not looking at the bigger picture. So, Well, yeah, um, but there's also the reality that sometimes it's very hard to find somebody you can afford to, to see depending on what insurance you've got and what the fees right. are and whether you've got right. financial resources. Right. Uh, and sometimes there are people who are not officially therapists, but they're just uh, you know, particularly compassionate and uh, sensitive listeners to people of a particular age or with a particular style of personality. And sometimes, you know, I've dealt with a number of people who had a neighbor who's been particularly helpful to them or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or uh, a favorite teacher or somebody who's taken a special interest and who knows how to listen to this person and who can offer some helpful advice and support to them. 
Uh, and sometimes that's been far more valuable than somebody who may have a shingle hung out in front with a degree on it. Right, okay. Well, we are out of time, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, and thank you to all who listened in. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. <laughs>